are on, or rather the doors are open. Look at that sunshine. It's amazing. And anyone want to vote to take church outside? <laughs> we should do that one day. I think, I think maybe in, in summer we'll um, just, just twist things slightly, open the doors and just, just enjoy a bit of sunshine. Does that sound good? Yes. Excellent. What I would just like to add to the notices just while um, some of the kids are heading out to different kids groups and stuff, uh, they'll be having a fantastic morning. Jack, you're a star. Thank you. From the catering team. Thank you. Uh, we are next Friday. Yeah, we've got the men's breakfast. Fantastic. Uh, we'll be gathering up at eight, eating breakfast at half eight. Um, because, hey, we, we need some substance for, for the blokes who are uh, hopefully going to be manning up to, to make the day work uh, next Saturday. But it's not just for men. But, but during the men's breakfast, we are privileged. I'm really excited about this one. We have got our very own Tubo Senebo, who's going to be sharing next Saturday morning. We're going to hear some good news. We're going to hear testimony. Yeah? The Bible is clear, and, and God's people should be hearing testimony of, their, of the people in the church. Yeah? So we need to be there. We need to be ready to listen. I think it's six quid. Sign up online. It's nice and easy. Uh, but let's make sure we're there to, to hear. Because if you know Tubo's story at all over the last year, in fact, um, going back further than that, God is with us in, in tough times as well as good times. And it's important to hear about the tough times as well. Yeah, It's important to hear how God is faithful. We just sang that song. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Yeah, there is no shadow of turning with thee, even when sometimes it feels like there are shadows everywhere. So that's going to be important. And then following that, about 10.30 start, uh, there's a work day. The idea is, we're, we're just at, we're in March. Suddenly spring is starting to, to, not well, quite sprung, but getting there. There's some sunshine. That's the moment where we start looking at our homes and going, ah, let's get out in the garden again. Let's, let's maybe clear away the debris that the storms have left. Maybe put the fence back up. Maybe fix the things that have fallen over. This is home. Yeah? Is it, is it, is it just my home or is it your home? Is it home? If it's home, then, then we look after it. If it's home, then we cherish it. And there's some indoor jobs and there's some outdoor jobs. There's some jobs for muscles and there's some jobs for brains. There's just jobs for everybody in between. That's fine. If you want to claim both, that's good. If you want to claim neither, that's not a problem either. We're going to be able to, to just give this, this place a few hours, a bit of polish, get it um, fit and ready, cleared up, ready for, for the spring, ready for, for the new season that God has got in this place and what he's going to do. So... Next Saturday, come, join us, bring some food. We're going to carry on working through lunch. The men, I think, are probably not going to need to worry about lunch because we'll be um, <clears throat> well-fed, always are. But turn up, we're here. It's family, it's our home. Amen? Excellent. This morning, we start a new series. We start a, another month, another topic. So this year, we've so far looked at what? Oh, who can remember? And faith. Love and faith. Well done. Love and faith. And, and the thing is, love and faith combined lead us on to do something about that. That's been a thread that's been woven through. And so we're going to look at discipleship. I'm going to try and stop walking around because I know that makes some people feel dizzy. Uh, I'll try. What can I say? Let's get in your Bibles. Let's get to the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter. So you're going fairly far to the end. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Cheers. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. I'm going to read this out in the NCV. i I'm aware sometimes when we read out, we can get tongue-tied, or I know I can, tongue-tied with old, uh, old words, old language, and, and sometimes the, the formal structure of things like the ESV may be slightly more difficult. So I'm just going to read this out in the NCV for us. Come to the Lord Jesus, the stone that lives. The people of the world do not want this stone, but he was the stone God chose, and he was precious. You also are like living stones. So let yourselves be used to build a spiritual temple, to be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. He will accept those sacrifices through Jesus Christ. The scripture says, 
I will put a stone in the ground in Jerusalem. Everything will be built on this important and precious rock. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. From Isaiah. This stone is worth much to you who believe, but to the people who do not believe, the stone is the, that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Psalms. Yes, also, he is a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, Isaiah again. They stumble because they do not obey what God says, which is what God planned to happen to them. But you, we know this bit, don't we? But you are a chosen people, a royal priest, the holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You were chosen to tell about the world and the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one time you were not a people, but now you are God's people. In the past you had never received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. That's a chunky bit of scripture from a a fisherman. I love the fact that God has used someone who who previously was a loudmouth, previously was a bit of a fool, previously was a bit of an Egypt, to be honest, to, to bring power and words of wisdom, to, to bring something that is so significant to us. Those words we're going to circle back to during this preach, during this morning. It was interesting, last week Craig shared about corrective love. The fact that, that we have to be willing to be challenged, to accept the challenge that sometimes we let worldly values creep into our our way of life, creep into our mindsets, creep into our actions, creep into the church in general, because we are the church. If it affects us, it affects the church. And there's an issue that, that I've had kind of bubbling away that I've wanted to share about for a while. Something that is endemic in our society, that actually has a massive impact on the church in a way that we maybe don't necessarily realise The issue of celebrity. The issue of celebrity is something that that we don't tend to to maybe dwell too much on because it's just what the world does. But the idea that nowadays, certainly in the last 15, 20 years, there has been no end of shows that allow you to become a celebrity without any substance. You become a celebrity just because you've appeared on something, eaten some grubs, done something slightly disgusting and survived and been voted, yeah? Yeah? That, that idea that you can become someone important simply because of the fact you survived for a few minutes and there was a camera pointed at you. Yeah? That's a scary thing. As we all see with City News, it's great having different people, but actually when they point the camera at you, it's terrifying. It's awful. It, you suddenly realise, actually for the presenters, it's amazing how well that they can do so often presenting. But the whole thing of celebrity culture is... Let's boil it down. It's it's not just about recognising someone. It's not just about fame. It's when we take things beyond the idea of simple respect or of honour, of consideration for for what someone's done, and we allow that to to develop into adoration, to unthinking submission, to the idea that we might pedestal, we might raise someone up because they're famous and, and, and defer to them in some way, shape or form because of their fame. Somehow we get to the belief so often in society that because someone's famous, unless they're infamous, that they're better, that somehow then, then they can be held to a higher standard, maybe they're, they're less fallible, which then sets them up for bigger fools. Some people chase celebrity. You watch some people who are desperate to be famous for five minutes. 15 seconds would do them if, if, if that's all they can get. They're desperate for it. They're, 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 they're getting their face on their YouTube or their face on their, their Insta accounts. They're doing everything they can to get out there. Other people end up with celebrity because, not because of anything they wanted to do, but because the light ends up shining on them. Elevated, given deference, maybe that they weren't necessarily comfortable or planning for or, or looking for. The thing is, whatever way it happens, once you are given deference, it's very quick that that can become normal. And once something becomes normal, it becomes uh, a way of life that suddenly allows you to do, or potentially do, all sorts of crazy, stupid things. You think of Harvey Weinstein, you wouldn't have thought that somebody 
like that would ever have got away with what he's got away with until, thankfully, recently. In any other walk of life, he wouldn't. A bit of fame, a bit of power, a bit of celebrity. And suddenly there's this, this awful elevation that allows someone to do crazy, crazy stuff. He's put on a plane that, that wasn't uh, in any way, shape or form undermined. It wasn't real. The thing is, celebrity has existed since ancient cultures. It has existed for time, literally time immemorial. Uh, Achilles would be an example of someone in, in ancient history, famous, famous, famous for something that he had no, no involvement in. The, the story goes that he was literally dipped in this potion that would, would make him in, uh, invulnerable, or, uh, unable to be harmed, except for the bit that... that that was held his heel. But he didn't do anything to make that happen. That was somebody else. But he was the one who became famous. Through every age, in film, in, in any form of media, music, TV, anything like that has, has allowed fame, politics even, has allowed fame to, to become something, celebrity, to become something that people have been able to have, use and exploit. Cicero, Napoleon... Diana, Marilyn Monroe, Stormzy, anyone that, that you can think of who has been famous has been affected by that fame. For bad, often, occasionally for good. There are even biblical celebrities. Let me just put, pick a finger or a piece of paper. You got, you got packs when you came through the door. This is a great opportunity to use them and then you might find them later on and, and reread some of the stuff. Shove one in 1, in one Peter chapter 2. And then jump back to John chapter 8. Because biblical celebrities are, are those who are, are there and existed and have been, been lifted up, raised up in a way that, that somehow disconnects from who they really are. We have here in, in chapter 8, verse uh, 53, I think it is, Jesus debating with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were big into, the church leaders of their day, were big into the important people of their faith. They were, they were so focused on, on thinking back, what did Abraham say? What did Moses say? They were, they were trying to tie back all the time to these big, significant people. And at this point, when Jesus is starting to challenge them, they come back with, are you greater than our father Abraham? Are you greater than our father Abraham? Abraham, this guy who, who gets name-checked repeatedly, time after time after time. God's even known as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We get David, David of, of Goliath fame, becomes celebrity. They sing songs about him, they elevate him, they, they give glory to him because of the fact that he killed thousands. Saul only killed a few thousands, David killed his tens of thousands. Celebrity. Solomon. Wow. The, the man who was wise. So wise. With so many wives and so many gold and so many horses and so much other stuff. We even imbibe unwittingly the, the celebrity culture into the church. When we start thinking or talking about the man of God. The man of God. That, ooh. 1 Corinthians, talked, uh, Paul has to, to step in and, and deal with an issue in the Corinthian church where they're saying, I follow Paul and I follow Paulus. And then somebody else chirps up and says, well, I follow Jesus, because that's the, the right answer at that point. And Paul slaps down all of them, saying, whoa, stop breaking apart the body. The man of God. When we start following significant Christians... I've got a list, and you might find some of them funny, you might find some of them actually closer to home, but the Pope, Rich Wilkinson Jr., Brian and Bobby Houston, Toby Mack, Benny Hinn, Carl Lentz, Graham Kendrick for the oldies, uh, Creflo Dollar, LZ7, Paul Scanlon, uh, Josiah Akindayomi, from uh, the guy who started up the RCCG network, Louis Palau. They're all people who are famous, in one sense, in the Christian community. Pastors, teachers, preachers. But what's the problem? Well, 
The problem might not be that they're well known. In fact, that's not the issue at all. The problem comes when people get raised to the level of a super saint. When they get raised to the level of a super saint. And that's the, been the heart, or is the heart of this message, the myth of the super saint. The myth of the super saint. Because no one is perfect. We know that, right? We, if, if we know our Bibles at all, we know that nobody is perfect, yeah? Yeah? Romans chapter 3, verse 10. If you want to go there, that's cool. Just because, hey, let, let's just absolutely confirm that we definitely know that this is the case, that nobody is perfect. We could have gone to 23 because that's, that's the obvious one. But no, let, let's go to verse 10. No one is righteous. No, not one. Nobody. So I'm not going to use the platform to, to pull apart other Christians because that would be wrong. Actually, that's not what, what this is about. But instead, let's, let's read something. I've heard this read out so many times, but I think it, it, it helps us just to, to peg things down a little bit and be a little bit more real about celebs in general, particularly in the, in the Christian world or in the, in the Bible. These are guys, these are all guys who were revered, revered by the Jews. Listen to this. Noah was drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer, not to mention a murderer. Elijah had suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, Job went bankrupt, John was the Baptist ate bugs. And it's true, it's nowadays it would be very woke of him, but never mind. Andrew lived in the shadow of his big brother, Peter denied Christ, all the disciples fell asleep while praying and then ran away when Jesus actually needed them. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer. Paul was a Christian killer. Oh, and Lazarus was dead. They all had their faults. They all had their issues. They'd, I take no credit for that. That has been pulled off the internet. But it's true, isn't it? All these people that the Jews revered had their faults. They had the massive issues. David, who, who is so often, oh, a man after God's own heart, I want to be like David, I want to be like David. Do you? <laughs> really? You might need some counselling. Jackie, you might have a few people if they want to be like... No, I, we get what we mean. We know what we mean, what we infer, but we're often, we, we gloss. We often gloss far too easily and far too quickly. The Jews had elevated these figures, these key figures. And in the process, they had ignored or airbrushed out their weaknesses and their failures. And in that process, they had actually created impossibly high standards that then everyone else was meant to, to, to attain to. And that's a crazy thing. Because the moment you create an exceptionally high standard in your life, and then you force yourself to try and achieve it, the moment you fail to, you're going to have a problem. Yeah? yeah? yeah. The sad news of, of Caroline Flack taking her life, by the, by the looks of it from and the media reports and all the rest of it, because of the fact that she couldn't deal with the, uh, maybe her human frailty and weakness compared to the image that, that was out there. That seems to be the sum of it. From what even her boyfriend said, it wasn't necessarily terminal for their relationship. But it became it because she set the standard of her expectations up here and the moment she deviated from those, the moment. Creating unachievable standards for those to follow, for us or for other people. Traditions, habits. The church, we're, we're pretty good at that. We're pretty good at setting high standards. And, and it's not wrong to, to say, be holy. God said it. Be holy for I am holy. We're, we're, we're meant to aspire. We're meant to, to do our very best. 
But let's start being real. Because actually the moment that you allow the gloss to be, to be applied to your life, you're going to create problems for yourself and you're going to create problems for everybody else. Yeah? And it often starts with, with those at the top because often those the top, the, the way that the society often sees it, often starts with pastors who, who feel they have to put on the, the I'm so blessed all the time face. Yeah? That, that God is always good and the sun always shines on me. When actually internally, sometimes being a pastor, sometimes working for a church, sometimes in that, that scenario, it feels like, why does it always rain on me? You get the exact opposite. But you feel obliged in some way, shape or form to, to put on the I'm always blessed face. The problem is, is that that then doesn't just affect the person who does it. It affects the next person they talk to. Well, they think, oh, well, if, if I start letting people know that, that I'm flawed, if I have a bad day, then, then my goodness, I can't, I'm, I'm going to look less. I'm going to look unholy. I'm going to look, you could, to be holy, you've got to always be blessed. It's a myth that we buy into, the super saint myth. When congregations start only ever posting the, the glossy, Insta-ready pictures of, of their church services, rather than the moments where someone dropped the mic, rather than the moments where something didn't quite go as planned. And that's okay. I loved communion last week. And was it, was it smooth and perfectly choreographed? No. It was real. It was real. And that's important. Sometimes we almost feel that we have to make sure our services are so smooth and so glitch-free because that way God is here. <laughs> you think about it. We, we, we adopt so much from the Old Testament, so much, that we, we take on. And the Old Testament's great, and I love it. Don't hear me wrong. I, I love the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. But we always read it, as we've been saying for, for months since we were doing the, um, the, the Bible course last year. Read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Always be seeing what you see in the Old Testament through the eyes of what is it that that, that, that now means in the context of Jesus. What does it mean because of Jesus? Because actually at that point we see so much more. The temple had to be perfect. But the temple was only a foreshadowing of who? Jesus. This church is not Jesus. We aren't. Jesus dwells by his Holy Spirit here within us. Yes? As we gather, we are a gathering of, of God's people. So yeah, we, we want to celebrate. And don't, don't get me wrong as well. I want, us to, to, I want the music to be fantastic. I want the, the atmosphere to be amazing. But you know what? If we play a bum note, who cares? In fact, we actually, we were praying in the, um, the prayer meeting beforehand. And, and one of the, um, the songs that, that started up was, I think it started in four different keys all at the same time. <laughs> It was great, and, and, and I, I have this thing. I can sing-ish, but if somebody else sings a note near me, I will go to that note. I don't have any ability to stick at the note. So if I'm near two or three people, and they, I go, Ooh, and it all goes completely horribly wrong, so I tend to let the song start and then shut up and just wait until someone's picked a note that we're going to follow. But this, this crazy thing, this, this song kind of fluctuated for a while and, and it ebbed and flowed and it grows good and then it died. It didn't matter. It gave glory to God. It didn't matter. Yes, okay, we want to try our best. Yes, okay, we, we want to give God the glory. But that to, to go for the fact that it has to be perfect is a myth. Yeah. It's the myth of the super saint. Yeah. The moment that, that we lead get to the point where we start having people self-censor. Maybe because they're, they think because they were sick that they, therefore, didn't have enough faith. I spent the last week on the sofa at home. I have downed so many blinking soothers and so many drugs and potions and all the rest of it. Is it because I lack faith? Maybe. But equally, I am just human. So let's be real. Because we're all sick at some point... Yeah? But why do we never put that up on, as, as an honest thing? Not as a, oh, where is me? But as an honest thing on our Facebook. Why don't we? Maybe the, 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 
the reality of the fact that being honest, that we may not have enough money in the bank sometimes. Many of you will know, many of you won't know, that actually there's a whole chunk of the staff have taken a, a pay cut because of the financial situations at the moment. That is a deliberate choice. Are they less blessed? Actually, I think that God is being faithful and good to them. They're even having to seek additional sources of work. That's a challenge. That's an impact on who they are. Are they less blessed? No. God is still good. God is still right. God is still the, the one who is, is first and foremost. But if we're not going to be prepared to mention it, because, oh, it might make God look less good. Really? Let's just be honest. Let's have that, that moment of honesty. Maybe when we fail a test or something that we're trying to achieve at work or in business does not go off. Suddenly we, we may feel that, oh, oh if, we, if we were honest about that, then maybe there's some, some significant hidden sin in our life. Well, there might be. But equally, there might not. It is quite possible, quite, quite, quite possible for there to be just things going wrong. God is still on the throne. If we see the history, as I said, the, the history of the Old Testament, it is full of things that didn't necessarily go right, yet God is still and always was on the throne. In fact, we've got a whole book. If you open your Bible to the very middle, you don't have to do it now, but if you open it to the very middle, it'll almost certainly land on Psalms unless you've managed to tear out half your Bible or something. <laughs> and at that point, you have found the perfect source of honesty in the Bible. Because as you go through the Psalms, you will find that, that every single human emotion is there. And they aren't trying to gloss their lives, and that ended up in Scripture. So if that ends up in Scripture, then why on earth can't we be honest with each other? Why on earth can't we be honest uh, with the world that actually sometimes being a Christian isn't always perfect? Because I think what the world finds difficult to believe is, is when we claim that we're perfect and we claim that, wow, God's amazing and everything runs right, and then to, to see that, that sneak behind our, behind our lives when we crack the, the perfect image and suddenly discover that, no, it's not. That is actually what hypocrisy is. And that's what the world struggles with at times, with us. There is a time, I'm not saying that the moment you walk up to someone you have to, to divulge all your personal failure and, and your habitual sins and everything. That you, you don't have to do that. Like, how are you? Well, let me start. <laughs> there is a time and a place for that. It's called a life group. It's called friendship. It's called accountability. Yeah, That's the place to, to have honest conversations. If you can't have an honest conversation with your life group, with the people that you are committed to, then, then where are you? You've got no accountability. It starts with your spouse. If you've got a spouse, that's great. But your life group is the best place. People to be able to, to speak to you, to speak honestly and speak directly. But equally, just on the normal stuff of life. There's a, a saying that I've heard so many times that every time I've heard it, I've taken issue with it. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. I refuse to be discouraged, to be sad or to cry. I refuse to be downhearted. She's like, what? Now, I kind of get what they're trying to say because actually the rest of the poem carries on to sort of say, but, but why? Because Jesus is, is my rescuer. Jesus is my saviour. Because Jesus will hold on to me. I get that. But actually, to start with, it's bunkum. It's complete tosh. Because there are times when we are stressed. Who has ever been stressed in here? My goodness, there are some... some the myth of the super saint maybe is wrong because some people didn't put their hands up. You've never been stressed? Really? Have you never been disappointed? I disappoint myself more often than, than I, I think anything else. And I probably disappoint everyone around me quite a huge amount as well. But the truth is, we do get stressed and we do get disappointed. The, the, the thing is, not that it's no wrong being there, being that moment of being disappointed and being stressed. Staying there is more of a problem. Not coming out of that. And I think that's what the guy is trying to say. 
But, but so often I've heard that phrase given, I'm too, str- I'm too blessed to be stressed, I'm too anointed to be disappointed. And you just think, <laughs> Obviously I'm not anointed and obviously I'm not blessed. And that's a fairly depressing place to find yourself in, which makes you then, well, if I'm depressed, I can't be anointed. And you go round and round and round in circles. You see when we start to say some of this stuff, how much nonsense if we're not careful if we aren't willing to be honest, that we fall into. One of the the things that we often do to to be able to give people celebrity and status and across the world is that we give them that, we raise them up by devaluing ourselves, by devaluing our own uh, rights and responsibilities in life. The thing is, elevation equals abdication. The moment you put someone up there and give them, well, you're the super saint, you make the decision. You're the super saint, you, you get to do everything. We'll, we'll, we'll just do what you say. You've effectively said, and don't ask me because I haven't got a clue. And I'm not going to bother trying. That's dangerous. That's so, so dangerous. But the thing is, it's, it's rooted in one level in biblical, Old Testament biblical thinking. You don't have to look these up. I'll say them out. I'll I'll, I'll put them up on on some form of social media so you can get hold of them if you want. But every single one of the major people that we hear of as leaders in the the Old Testament, in some way, shape or form, had the Spirit of God come upon them. But it's mentioned very specifically that the Spirit of God comes upon them to give them the ability to make that decision to lead. So Moses gets gets God's Spirit upon him in Numbers 11.25. Gideon gets it in Judges 6.34. Samson gets it in Judges 14.19. That, if, if anything, if that doesn't tell us that, that God's indwelling um, of his spirit in, to enable us to do stuff doesn't um, preclude the opportunity for people to make a cock-up of their lives, if that, yeah? This is Samson we're talking about. Yeah, the guy with long hair, but also was a terrible womanizer and, and caused so many troubles. It doesn't stop failure just because of the fact that sometimes we're gifted. Gifting and character. Gifting and character. Gifting alone, fantastic, but it will go bang. I'd much rather have character than just gifting. Both, both would be good. Saul, the Holy Spirit comes upon him in 1 Samuel 10.10. He goes on and prophesies. The Holy Spirit comes on David in 1 Samuel 16.13, but we know Samuel eventually fails. Ezekiel the Holy Spirit comes upon him in 11.5, Ezekiel 11.5. Malachi, no, Micah rather, sorry. Micah 3.8, the same. All these people to prophesy, to speak, to lead, to make decisions, to do significant stuff in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and empowers them, okay? The Holy Spirit gives them the ability. But it wasn't the normal experience of the people in the Old Testament. God's Spirit came upon individuals for a reason. The thing is, we've habitually left that as our normal think about for today. The way that we consider maybe leadership or the way that we consider super saints or whatever today is built so often off that foundation. Let's read something else that Peter said. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Peter, we know, was not a super saint. And I think that's the reason why quietly all of us love him. Because of the fact that he showed that it was perfectly possible to be completely human and fallible, but also to be used by God. Acts 2, 14 to 18. Just after the Holy Spirit has come upon all of them, the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, tongues of fire or what looked like fire yeah fire the the symbol of the holy spirit you only have to do a study flicking through back through through the bible you'll find that time and time and time again you would have seen in the in the bible course from verse 14 but peter stood up with the 11 apostles and in a loud voice he spoke to the crowd My fellow Jews and all of you who are in Jerusalem, listen to me. Pay attention to what I have to say. These people are not drunk. That's always a good way of starting a conversation, isn't it? Listen to me, we're not drunk. As you think. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. That wouldn't stop people in some places, would it? 
But Joel, verse 16, the prophet wrote about what is happening here today. God says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all kinds of people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And at that time I will pour out my spirit also on many male slaves and female slaves. And they will prophesy. Are they all the leaders? Are they all the significant people in the the kingdom? Doesn't sound like it. Your male and your female slaves, well, they're pretty much at the bottom of the pile. They were the ones who used to wash the muck off your your feet when you walked around and you had the camel poo on your foot. Yeah? They're they're not going to be significant people. Right at the beginning, you want if you've got your, your finger still on the piece of paper back in 1 Peter, just to prove that this wasn't Peter spouting off on the spur of the moment, that's something that he later grew to, to regret or to disagree with, you'll find he says this, again, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for God's own possession. You were chosen to tell about the wonderful acts of God, called out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one time you were not a people, but now you are God's people. In the past you had never received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. If we check who he's writing to at that point, you only have to go back to the very start of 1 Peter, and you'll find that the very people he's writing to, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, to those who are the elect exiles, the elect called by God, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and the other place. The exiles. This is not Peter saying, all those of you who are going to be the significant leaders of, of God's people are therefore filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not. He's saying, you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit If you believe in God, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you submit to him, at that point, he places his spirit in us. Yeah, we're going to come on to that maybe in a little bit. When we place church leaders, key preachers, worship leaders, apostles, prophets, etc. on a pedestal, and we call them the man of God or the woman of God, not to be sexist, we often unintentionally parrot the Old Testament dynamic but God has changed it. God has changed it. And we are the ones who need to maybe catch up sometimes. And in doing so, if we parrot that and if we believe it, we we make ourselves less significant. We make ourselves less responsible. We make ourselves less uh, involved in all that God is wanting to do. We elevate and then we abdicate. I'm not saying that everyone is equally mature. Don't, that's equally not what I'm saying. You expect someone who's been in the faith for, for 10, 15, 20 years, if they're doing it as God had asked, should have a clue, should be mature. Though someone who's come to faith in the last 30 seconds is not going to be as mature as. Yeah, that, that's, that's logical. But there's a difference between saying how much you've learned and grown and understood and matured compared to the fact that the Holy Spirit is in each of us. We don't offshore our responsibility to God's anointed because we are God's anointed. You and I, we are all God's anointed people. Different purposes, different places, different functions. That's cool, but we are anointed. So when someone preaches... I hope, and I said, I'll, I'll get the, the notes out. I only managed to get them written down last week, uh, yesterday, because I wasn't feeling too great. But when I get them out, check them. Look at them. See if I'm telling the truth. For anyone who preaches, love the Lord your God with all your mind, Deuteronomy 6.5, yeah? Use your mind. Check. Make sure that, we do it, that what we're saying is right. Not saying that we're going to be deliberately trying to trip you up. That's not what it's about. But it's a challenge for all of us. As we, as a church, seek new elders and seek God's people to 
to be those who we will recognise, see in this body who are uh, called by God for that responsibility. It should be that we're choosing out of an absolute abundance. It should be that, we're, that almost anybody could be called. It shouldn't just be those who are 59 and, and got grey hair and whatever else. It, it doesn't have to be that way. It's about being mature in God. It's about fulfilling the category, the, 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 the qualifications in uh, Timothy and Titus. About having maturity, about having your household under control. It's about knowing God and having faith. That's a challenge. But then when we do call elders, let's not pedestal them and say, oh, but they, 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 they know everything. No. But they'll be the ones tasked with responsibility. But they'll need prayer, they'll need support, they'll need wisdom, they'll need everything else that they can possibly get. Not just them set up on a, on a pedestal. So what about us? Where do we go from here? Let's, let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. Perfect timing, Mike. (laughs) Of course you are. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Paul speaking. Writing this, he says, But when the right time came, God sent his son who was born of a woman who lived under the law. God did this so that he could buy freedom for those who were under the law so we could become his children. That verse 5, if you go for a slightly more word-for-word translation, says adopted as sons, that we are adopted as sons. And since you are God's children in the NCV, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts and the spirit cries out, Father. So now you are not a slave, but you're a God's child, son. And God will give you the blessing he promised because you are his child or his heir. You and I are adopted. It's very easy that we can, we can get into the whole thing of well, if, if I've got the Spirit of God, that I'm great, fantastic, I'm wonderful. Let, let's just ground ourselves. We're adopted into God's family by His grace, by His mercy, not because of anything that we've done or because of the smarts that we have or the, or the, the, uh, the, the qualifications or the money in our bank. God's adopted us into His family by His grace because He loves Romans 11 talks about the fact that we are grafted in because you know what? God had originally uh, particularly worked with Israel and it talks about us being grafted in. A, A wild olive branch we're described as. We're the wild ones. Yeah, you know that? It's okay to be wild, but we're grafted in. We're the sons. And I'm sorry, ladies, the word is sons, but there is a reason for that. Because that was a patriarchal society. That was a society where, where when they did the feeding of the 5,000, as Mary mentioned earlier, they only counted the men. I'm not saying it was a good idea, but they only did. And then happened to tag on, oh, and the women and children were there. So the use of the word sons here isn't a, a slight on feminism, but it's a way of saying, actually, you are all of the highest significance. You are all of the highest significance in the family of God, given the rights and privileges of the family of God. We know what those privileges are. Jesus even tells a story about it, the prodigal son. What was given to him? The ring that was given to him and put on his finger. The ring that was effectively the family credit card the clothes, the robes, over this stinking, sweaty, smelly, horrible person, the robe of righteousness was placed. It's placed on us. That's what he does. He clothes us with robes of righteousness. 
the ring that, that sim, uh, symbolizes so much commitment in our lives, in our lives, but actually the ring symbolizes so much more in God's life. And he gives us shoes, gets rid of the bare feet, gives us some dignity, not because we've earned it, but because he gives it to us, because of his grace, because of his love. And then he calls us his heirs, that we will inherit everything, everything. There is nothing that we are going to miss out on. Nothing that, that this world has is anything compared to what God has for us. So often we, we get our noses so close to the dirt and so close to the, the stuff of life because it's important to us, because we think it's, it's going to make a difference to us, whether it be the latest car or the latest trainers or the, the whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. Because this life will end. Let's be real about that too. This life will end. But it's about the life to come that's more important, where our focus and our priorities should be. Because he says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are seated in heavenly places with him. That's the chair that's more important. These ones, well, they're all right. They're a little bit uncomfortable if you're a bit too tall. You might not have as much leg room as you want. But when you're seated in heavenly places, you will have all the leg room you can possibly need. In fact, if you want more leg room on, on a Sunday morning, these seats at the front, they're not special. They're no more holy or, or anything than anyone else's. Sit on them. The only thing I'd ask, if you sit on the front row, give it some in worship. Because you know what? If, if, you, if you stand at the front and, and you don't do anything, you're just standing there like, oh, bored, pick my nose. Everyone else will, will just react to it. It's true. You watch it. It's a practical reality in life. But come, sit down the front if you want some leg room. If you find yourself in a row where, where there's literally economy minus, come down the front. Find some space. It's cool. So what about us? Well, if we're not going to be super saints, because actually it's a myth, what are we? Well, we're saints. You and I are saints. You and I want to be the greatest that we can possibly be. We want to be the, the best we can be. There's nothing wrong in that, but we're still just saints. But that's pretty awesome, yeah? yeah. We stop putting people up there and we stop putting ourselves down. We suddenly realise we are the saints. We are God's saints, called for his purpose in this place. And if we want to be the greatest then who better to end on than to quote Jesus? Let me take us back to Matthew. Matthew summarising what Jesus was saying. Matthew 23, verse 11. The greatest among you must be what? Servant of all. Isn't that dangerous? The super saint myth, the, the pedestaling, the celebrity, we can often end up that we put people on a pedestal and they, they're, they're not allowed to do any of the insignificant jobs. What rot. Absolute rot. We all need to do jobs. We all need to get down on the floor and clean it. We all need to, on, on Saturday, I will be as much as anybody else. We'll all be in here and out there and, and doing jobs. We'll all get sweaty and dirty. Don't turn up in your best clothes. Your, your robes of righteousness are good, but... but maybe your work robes of righteousness but it'll be okay because we all serve because we are if we want to be the greatest be the servant of all not because we're least important not because we're less significant but like Jesus we know who our father is and as he washed his disciples feet he did it out of love and he was the greatest of all wasn't he stand with me for a sec that crazy myth of the super saint. I wonder if I, I hear the, the sound of a golden cow mooing as it, it, it's just had its side impaled or something. <sighs> Father God, we thank you that you are great. We thank you that you are awesome. We thank you that you love us, not because we are great, not because we are super saints, but because we are loved by you. That's why you love us, because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your kindness. 
And Father, we place ourselves before you and ask that you would dwell in us, that your Holy Spirit, absolutely as your word says, would dwell in us, would lead us, would change us, would, would make us the disciples that you would want us to be. But Father, may we, may we never get so big for our boots that we forget who, who did it all for us and who served us and therefore serve others. To love you and to give ourselves for you to everyone around to serve. Father, we thank you that you are good. Amen. Cheers.